All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Julie. I'm the Customer Success Manager here at Intuitive. We welcome you to our 2021 virtual event, which includes three sessions. The first, additional training on CAP eForm for pathology. Session two, validating synoptic reporting standards. And session three, cancer surgery standard protocols and you. Just a few things before we get started. All sessions are being recorded and are available upon request starting Friday, November 19th. You can email julie at intuitive.com. Uh, there will also be a brief survey when you exit the event. We ask that you take a moment to fill that out as we appreciate your feedback for future events. Each session will also include a Q&A portion at the end. So if you have any questions at any time, please enter them into the chat and if, uh, we'll get to as many as possible. If we don't answer your question, we will get back to you after the event. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn over the floor to m 2 of Dan Fossey and John Everson, who will cover tips, tricks, answer frequently asked questions, and more ways to get the most out of your CAP eForm experience. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. This is John Everson, and I'm the Vice President of Support at Intuitive. And along with me today is uh, Dan Fossey, and we'd like to thank you for joining this session. We'll be going over a few things today. Um, first of all, we'll be going over, Dan will be actually leading this. We're going to be going over um, a session that we've done before, we've modified a little bit, but um, the feedback we received last year through the survey um, was that people would like to have this again. So we're gonna be going through some of the end user tips and tricks. Um, then I'll show you some of the uh, administrative functionality. Um, this will pertain to uh, publishing the new CAP uh, templates, uh, the CAP templates and worksheets that came out, uh, as well as doing uh, the ordinary updates throughout the, uh, the year. Uh, we'll go over some of the support options and at the end we'll stop for um, some questions and answers. So what Dan will be covering today will be deleting templates and worksheets, navigation options with user preferences and settings, verifying templates that are in use, as well as reviewing the CAP CAP uh, protocol documentation. So with that, I will turn it over to Dan. And here we go. Thank you, John. And welcome to all of you who joined us today. We're really glad you're here. And I'll cover some basic navigation and functional features of CAP eForm software. So let's get started with a template that'll give us some context for our exercise today. So I just want to confirm that I'm sharing the screen. Can you see the uh, template for stomach carcinoma? Yep, we can. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. So one of the things that I want to point out on this template, which is going to give us sort of our context for our tour today, is in the upper left hand corner in the title bar, you'll see the name of your surge path case. So in this case, I've put in a fictitious number of S21-54321. So as a pathologist, you're probably used to checking to make sure you've got the right case. This will just indicate to you, yes, you are on the case that you intend to hook up with the checklist. Directly below the title bar is a section of uh, system controls, file, edit, view, help in this little toolbar. We'll explain some of the features of those as we go through today. And then directly below that, you'll see the title of the particular checklist that you've chosen to work with. In this case, it's the stomach checklist. So that brings us kind of to the first point of what we want to describe here is, um, how do I know that I have the correct version of the checklist? And you'll see this little I information icon. When you'll use that is occasionally you'll get an email from the college that'll say, dear CAP electronic cancer checklist user, uh, CAP electronic cancer checklist release is available and the re release includes content and metadata changes to 19 templates and please click the link to see what templates we've changed, et cetera. And that starts you wondering, do I have the right template? Do I need to update? How do I know? The way you check that is with this little information icon next to the title. You click on that, it opens this window in the middle where you can view the title of the template, stomach, 
our version control information here at Intuitive. And right below it is the line that you're going to need to look at, which is CAP ECC June 2021 release. If that matches the latest update, you know you're all set. If it doesn't, you'll know that you can get an update for that. So this is how you check, and this is the line that you need to look at right here is what release are you looking at? That's how you know you're up to date. Pretty simple, just file. Uh, no, actually we're doing the uh, version control. It's the information icon, open up this window, take a look at this line, you should be all set. So next let's talk a little bit about navigation. Many of you, if not most, are probably already users of the system. So you've got your methods for moving around in the system. Maybe there will be some little additional piece of information that will make this easy. Our goal is to make sure that the navigation through the software is not first and foremost in your mind, but that it functions and flows easily so that you can focus on the interpretive portion of your diagnosis. So first thing to notice, this checklist page is divided into two columns. On the left-hand side, there is a list of the focus areas on which you'll be responding. And on the right-hand side is the specific checklist area that's highlighted. So for instance, on the left, procedures highlighted. You can see on the right, here is the question and the available answers for that particular question. So the first thing I want to point out here is you're not constrained to do this checklist in order. Don't feel like we're trying to restrict how you do your work. You can simply go through this in any order you want. For instance, if you are looking in the microscope, you have the histologic type in front of you and you wanna answer that question right away, you simply line up your mouse with histologic type, click on it, it opens that pane on the right-hand side that includes the title of the question, histologic type, and all the available choices, and then you can go ahead and make your choice. One little note of this, if you do go out of order, occasionally you may run into questions that are embedded in another question, and it's driven by the logic of the response that you make. So for instance, if you're going out of order and you say, hey, I want to indicate the distance to margins, you look through this list on the left and it's like, oh, I don't see anything about distance to margins. However, if you do need to find that, you can open it by going to margin status, answer that the margins are negative. Now, all of a sudden you see, oh, there's my distance to margin question. So that just kind of um, points out to you that there may be some questions that you might have to dive a little bit deeper to find. But bottom line is, for the most part, you can do this in the order that you choose to work your way through the checklist. The one thing, too, that you'll notice, though, is lining up your mouse with, for instance, tumor size, clicking on it, moving it back over here to answer the question can be a little bit clunky. And sometimes it's a lot of distance you have to cover and you have to line it up pretty precisely to get this to open. So for that, we've provided you with these navigation buttons at the top of the answer field where you have next unanswered, next required, previous, and next. And those buttons do exactly what they say they do. If you click next unanswered, it will move you to the next question that you haven't yet answered, whether it's required or not. If you click next required, you're a minimalist. It's only gonna take you to those that have required data elements um, i.e. those that are identified in the list with this little red circle in front of them. It's going to skip over the ones that don't have the red circle that are optional data elements. So if you want to move through the list quickly, next required is your button. Previous to next, do exactly what they say. You want to back up one, whether you've answered it or not, whether it's required or not, you can use previous. And the opposite is true for next. You want to move forward, again, whether it's answered or required, it doesn't matter. It's just gonna move you to the next question. So the navigation buttons will help you out. Now you'll notice too that next unanswered is green. That means that that's your default navigation action that is set up for you every time you use the system. What that does for you is one, it brings it also over to the right hand side of the answer field so that if that's a simpler mouse move for you, where if you click not identified and then you want to move ahead, 
you can simply slide your mouse over to the right, click next on answered there. So that gives you a third option as far as navigation. And the other thing which um, it also does is it allows you to use the tab key to move and execute your next default navigation move. If you have next on answered there, you can simply click tab, it'll move you to the next one. So you think, okay, I'm a minimalist. I, I don't need to do next unanswered and look at every one of them. And so how do I change my default? The way you do that is you go over to the view menu item here in the toolbar, click on that, it drops down this menu and about three quarters of the way down, you'll see this default navigation action, which if you hover over it, it opens these three choices, next, next unanswered and next required. Right now, next unanswered is green because there's a check mark next to it. That's your default navigation action. If you want to change it to next unanswered required, you put a click on that right in front of it. It changes that to green. And trust me, it is now checked in the box. So there it is. I'm not going to change it. I'll just leave it there. The other thing that this view menu will do for you is it will allow you to choose Single, se single select list auto advance. So right now your default navigation action is next required. If I put a check mark in front of single select list auto advance, and again, trust me, the check mark is there. I didn't undo it. Anytime you encounter a single select list like this, where there is a radio button in front of the answer, if you click that radio button, that click will register that answer, record it, and execute your next default navigation move without an additional click. So right now I have next required as my default. I'm in perineural invasion and I wanna say I don't see it. So I'll click here and without touching the mouse again, it moved me on to the next required question. So that's a handy feature. Once you get used to using the checklist, you're comfortable with it, you wanna motor through it, you can set up that in the view menu allow single select list auto advance. Now, one little caveat about that is if you're in a multi-select list identified by these square tick boxes, it's not going to advance you to the next one because it needs to give you a chance to indicate that not only is carcinoma in situ present there, there's also low grade dysplasia present at the margin, et cetera. And the same will be true if you have a single select list with one of these pink boxes afterwards, that you want to fill in additional information, it will stay on that answer panel so that you can actually fill in that answer and then execute your next required move manually. But it will eliminate quite a few clicks for you and allow you to move through a checklist fast, especially if you do the same checklist over and over. You're signing out a lot of Durham cases or something like that. So that's basic navigation and setup in the checklist. Now, for instance, if you've started to fill out this stomach checklist and you decide, okay, it's the end of the day, I'm waiting for recuts, I've got to get some special stains on this, so I'm going to submit this tomorrow after I finish it up. So I click save. It's going to indicate to me that not all the available or the required questions haven't all been answered. You can see I've still got quite a ways to go. In the uh, key at the bottom, the counter shows that I still have 15 left, but end of the day, I'm going to wrap this up. So I say, okay, it saves and closes this checklist associated with 54321. So now you can see it here, saved synoptic reports, stomach with this case, and I go home. Next morning, I come in, I open up S21 54321. I want to take a look at this stomach case and finish it. I simply click on stomach, indicate open, and here it is, it lands me back in the report where I left off. But now this morning you look at it and you realize, hey, you know, I, I, my special stains are showing me that this is not just a basic adenocarcinoma. I really have a neuroendocrine tumor here. So I really should change my checklist over to a different type. I want the stomach neuroendocrine tumor checklist. How do I ditch this? How do I get it disassociated with this case? And how do I delete it? Here's how you do it. First thing you do is you open the checklist like we just did. So you'll go into the case, 
bring up the checklist, click open, and here you are. Then go to the file menu, which is right in this toolbar here in the upper left. Click file, opens this drop down, and you'll go to delete. Once you click delete, it opens this alert that says it's going to delete the data set. You can't undo it, and this information is going to be gone. Are you sure? And you say yes. Now you'll notice that when you bring up the case S21 54321, there is no longer the stomach template associated with that case. It's deleted, it's gone. And now you can say, I want a new synoptic report. I want to open the stomach neuroendocrine tumor checklist, open, and here it is. Now this case is going to be associated with your search path number in the title bar, and you're ready to fill it out. Now, in the case that you are not used to working with these checklists, you know, you don't sign out a whole lot of uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and you want a little bit of help with this by looking at the CAP paper protocol, you can simply click this link here down below the answer key. And what it's going to bring up is the version matched CAP CAP protocol for the June 2021 release. So it's not like you're digging into your computer where you've stashed this and your favorites and it's about five versions old. In another window, when you click the CAP protocol link, it's going to open the CAP paper protocol that you're familiar with. And you can then go through the checklist features and get any amount of data out of this that you need from the explanatory notes, et cetera. And just to double check, did um, when I dragged the um, new window of the stomach over, did that show up on the screen? Is that sharing? It is. All right, beautiful, thank you. Then that wraps up the presentation here of some basic navigation, some basic anatomy, and how to delete a checklist. Oh, and one, one key thing I will point out here is this delete function is going to be there with all our releases except for the ones in Cerner Millennium. Cerner Millennium, you have to go in and use a Cerner function to delete. You'll click the remove button in the, um, the online review mode. So that's the only one that's a little bit different. If you have Cerner Millennium, go into the Cerner functions, use the remote uh, control or command in the online review mode. Otherwise, for the rest of you, it's simply file, delete, confirm, gone. That's it. Thanks, John. Back to you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. You bet. Uh, Dan, can you unshare? Okay, thank you. So I can share my screen. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, the second half of what we're going to be doing today is the administrative functionality. And again, this is a, um, a function of uh, the CAP eForm and or expert if you have uh, the expert version. And since the, as Dan mentioned, that the CAP um, annual releases happen annually, um, and then there are quarter releases. This is part of the application that people only use a couple of times a year. So we do get a lot of questions on that. So we're going to go through some of the basic functions of that here today. You'll see that the first thing I'll cover is uh, the new CAP worksheet and or uh, template publishing. We'll talk about activate versus deleting templates and worksheets. And then we'll follow up with uh, template worksheet locks and uh, status. So the first thing that I'll do here is um, I will bring up or bring over onto my screen the application. Now, this is the same application, uh, the same program that the pathologist used to fill out the end product. The only difference is that um, instead of being launched by your LIS, um, we're going to open it manually. And the, the folks who have been uh, designated to update these templates, worksheets, uh, have a login. 
Um, if you feel like you want to log in too, uh, you can simply contact uh, your IT and they can forward the request to us. And I, at the end, I will show you how you can actually forward that request so we can add you to the list. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to log in as an administrator. And this will take just a second when we log in as an administrator, it'll go into uh, what is known as our database administrator mode. So the first thing that I want to do is look at what's available in the cloud. And again, the folks at your individual sites uh, do receive uh, periodic emails from us, letting them know that uh, new templates and worksheets are in fact uh, available. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the CAP 2021, CAP 2021 release. And you can see that I have uh, a list of all 104 templates uh, listed on the left-hand side. Those are available for your site. So once you do that, what you would do next is select whether you're going to move them into either a test environment or move them into production. For today's demonstration, I'll move in into the test environment in my area. So I'll click on the group test and then I will go over. And right now I'm on the 2020 February cab, so I will click that. So you'll notice um, the list looks very similar. Uh, the names on the left and the right, they match. But you'll also notice uh, there's a difference. The versioning on the left-hand side is beginning with 10. All of those templates and worksheets begin with the number 10. On the right-hand side for the prior year, they begin with a version nine. So the first thing you will wanna do when you're doing an annual update is you would want to inactivate all of those uh, worksheets. So in the lower right-hand side, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna click on inactivate. And if the application will come back and just ask me to confirm if this is what I want to do. Now, what active, inactivate actually does is it keeps all the templates and worksheets in the database. It just makes them unavailable for brand new cases starting out. So you don't have to worry at point of upgrade from last year's to this year's if you have a case that's still pending. You've saved it, but you haven't signed it out yet. That's okay because once you open a synoptic and save it to a particular specimen, that is married to that specimen for life. So even if you come back six months later and have to reopen it, that original template or worksheet that you used to fill it out will still be available for that particular um, specimen. Anything you start brand new after we do the update, it will start using the new versions. And yes, you can mix and match. So you might have uh, one synoptic on a case that's uh, last year's version and another one that you've added to it this year's version. So you can actually do this real time without causing an outage. Doctors do not have to sign out all of their cases before the update is done. So with that said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just click OK. And what that will do is, again, it go ahead and inactivate all those uh, templates and worksheets. You can see now that they're gone. The next step, and this is uh, clearly outlined in documentation that we uh, send you for every one of these releases, is to switch over to the new group, which is now called Synoptic Pathology Algorithms. So we'll select that template set. And now I'm ready to publish. For time's sake, I'm not going to select every single one, all 104, uh, because that will take a little bit of time. So I'm just gonna select uh, all of the templates and worksheets begin with the letter A. Once you have those selected, we'll just click on the uh, publishing arrow in the middle. And you can see that uh, as they deploy, it will keep you apprised of the progress. So we're already up to five of six, six of six, and it's telling me now that my deployment is completed. The next thing you'll notice is on the right-hand side, it has showed me the templates and worksheets that it's published into my test environment. And again, I can confirm I'm in my test environment and I'm using the new template set group. On the left-hand side, the ones that I have published are now turned green. And that's fairly important as we move forward because after you've updated your entire list from the 
um, last year's to the current, and they're all green. Periodically, as we do have coming up, there'll be a quarterly release. So there'll be some number of templates and worksheets that will need to be updated. Once you get the email that says they are ready to go and you can put them either into your test environment or your uh, production environment, when you log in, what you will notice is that some of the templates and worksheets on the left-hand side will not be green. There might be five or 10 or 20 of them that are not green. That indicates that those are the templates and worksheets that need to be updated. So it's a very easy, very quick uh, visual. All you would need to do is go and click on whatever, whichever uh, template that isn't green and then hit the publish arrow. And uh, for example, I could just hit Biodux or bone biopsy, click on that and it will update those particular um, templates. Once that's complete, then you will see that um, those two will also turn green and that should happen here any second. There it goes. And there they are. So again, when you come in, you would see these two, you'd know how to, uh, to actually do that publishing. So one of the next um, questions we get frequently is, what's the difference between inactivate all and delete template? Well, as we just talked about, inactivate all will take those uh, prior version templates, make them unavailable to the system for starting new, for starting new synoptics uh, as you move forward because we've already published the new ones. The delete function is to remove any template or worksheet that you don't care to see in your list. So if you're an institution that doesn't do certain types of synoptics, so maybe you're in a hospital, you don't specialize in lungs or other type of cases, what you can do is to go through, you can select the ones that you do not want to see in the available list. You can click on delete template and it will remove those. Conversely, when you go to publish, instead of clicking on every single one to publish, you can deselect the ones that you don't want published and therefore you only get to see uh, what you would like to see. So one of the last things that uh, we get a lot of questions about is um, occasionally a doctor will go in as uh, Dan uh, demonstrated earlier to re-edit a case that's been saved or even submitted uh, before sign out. They have new information they either want to add or change in the worksheet. However, when they come back, uh, they might see an error or a, um, a message that looks something like this. And again, all the LISs are slightly different how they present this, but you would see that this particular case, um, DD210007, has two synoptics attached to it. One of them has a status of in use. And if I try to open that, I will get the message that the data set is in use and cannot be opened at this time. Please try again when it is not in use. You will see this error or this message for two reasons. One, the case has been locked um, accidentally and cases can be locked accidentally for a couple of reasons. One is the computer gets disconnected from the network and it loses connection to the database and or um, maybe a computer crashed. But usually it's a technical problem that causes a, a, uh, a specimen to get locked accidentally. The only other way you will see one in use is if another doctor was in the same case, which is, is extremely rare because it's probably not in their work list. But if for some reason, maybe a transcriptionist or an administrative person was in there in that case as well, you could see the lock. But let me show you how to actually remove this lock. So what I will do is I'll say, okay, I will close here and I will go back into um, the administrator. Let's just take a second to bring the administrator back up again. So I'll go in as an admin. And once this comes up, all you would really need to do is go to either the test or the production environment 
uh, where that uh, synoptic is locked. I don't really need to go and open up the whole cloud side because I'm not going to be publishing. So what I will do in this case, I know it's in my test environment. I will go to test. I will select the template set. And then what I will do is go to the upper left, right below the toolbar on that blue ribbon. I have a couple of options there. First one is templates. That's the view we see now. That's for publishing and updating templates. The second one is locking. So when I click on that, what it will do is it'll look at the database and show me any synoptic that is actually locked. What I can do is click on the case that I want to unlock and then go down to the extreme lower right and click on remove lock. When I do that, you can see that now I have zero cases locked. We'll go back to our production view of eForm. It'll take just a second for it to come up. And here we are. You can now see that lock has been removed. And you are now able to go in and actually do the edit and continue to fill out that particular uh, worksheet. The only caveat on that would be uh, for a couple of the LISs. Within the SunQuest CoPath world, you have a Synoptic Unlock tool that's actually built into your Browse All menu. So you can just go to Browse All, go down to Synoptic. You'll see a uh, line item there for Synoptic Unlock tool. Click on that, enter the, um, the case ID, the specimen ID, click OK, and it will unlock that for you. You don't need to go through the administrator. Uh, the same is true for CERN Millennium. Uh, that can be done through the uh, online review. So at this point, um, we're going to talk a little bit about support options just for a couple of seconds. Um, and and the, your support options are actually this. Um, the first, and this is actually the fastest and easiest way to, to get a hold of us, is send an email to support at intuitive.com. Uh, this could be for you have an issue you have a request, maybe you were gonna ask a question, hey, can the product um, do this? Um, is there a way to you know, make it function a little bit differently? Or I just can't access it. No matter what your question is, send it to support at intuitive.com. It will know uh, basically who you are because of the domain your mail comes from and your request will be routed to the proper individual or individuals groups um, that handle that type of question. And you'll be contacted um, pretty close to immediately. Uh, we try to get back to everybody you know, very, very quickly. The second way to do it is just go to our website, find the support function, and you can enter a ticket through there. Or you can even go old school, uh, pick up the phone and call us at the, uh, the number you see have on the screen. So at this point, uh, Dan's going to join back again, and we're going to open it up to questions and answers. Excellent. Thanks, John and Dan. Uh, we have a few questions here. Great. Uh, starting off with, is it possible to change the color of the eye to a different color? So the pathologist sees that there is an update. I should say, uh, eye is the letter I. I, the I can take that one, John. I, I one of the things is the the update schedule is driven by the college and so you're going to be first notified notified by the college that there is an update however once we're notified um that there might be something we could look into that for a future version um that is not something that it does currently but it may be a suggestion for the next version we'll take a look at it thanks Excellent. And I actually, just to remind you, I would uh, encourage whomever asked that question to send that question to support at intuitive.com so we can start looking into that immediately. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> and uh, next up, are the view menu item responses user specific? That is, if I check the single click advance, will that only impact interactions for my username? That's correct. So the other users in your department will have their own profile in the system. Great. Next question is, what if my case is no longer a malignancy and I want to remove the checklist entirely? 
then just use the uh, delete function as we showed you and don't replace it with anything and you'll be all set. So delete removes the association of the case and the data from the case, um, from the checklist in the uh, server. And so that case will be gone and just don't associate a new one with it and sign it out as a benign case. Right. Um, just a few more questions. Uh, and also as a reminder that this is being recorded. So if you want to review it later after this and see some of these again, you can always uh, request it and we will send you the link. Uh, next question, are there controls on questions where PT and PN has influence on the choice the pathologist fills in? Um, actually, we, we it's kind of the other way around. It's that, reverse, exactly. Yeah, the choices that the pathologist makes in filling out the template influences how the system assigns PT and PN. So for instance, breast cancer, uh, invasive breast cancer, the, the PT is driven strictly by size. So when you in right. put the size as a specific measurement into the checklist, it will then work through the algorithm and assign a PT according to that data that you've input. So it's kind of the, the reverse. And also uh, note that as you go through and you fill out the information, the application, um, unless it's an unusual case, will assign a, a T and an N score automatically. Um, in all cases, you are, as a user, able to override that answer and change it if you would like. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, is there extra control in the templates on gender and or age? No, because usually that is driven by the um, the LIS. So that information is usually contained within your lab information system. And the uh, CAP eForum application is pretty much strictly um, geared towards filling out that cancer template that um, the CAP has uh, published. Yeah, our, exactly. Our content that we have in the checklists comes from the CAP and the AJCC and their expert panels. And so if they indicate a difference in um, the patient's sex or age, um, whether it's a pediatric case or not, um, or male anatomy or female anatomy, that's going to be driven by the expert panel that put together the content of the checklist. Correct. The only... Um... Probably uh, variant on this would be um, if you're a customer who is standalone and not using an LIS, um, then therefore there could be fields that we could customize. Thanks. Uh, next question, and you know we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next few minutes. And if we don't get to your question, you know keep asking them, and we'll definitely follow up after the event. Uh, the next question is: How did you open the administrator? Um, might be better oh. to just go to the video, but it's up to you. <laughs> so the, um, how did I open that? It can be opened a couple of different ways. So if you have a, an environment where the CAP eForm and or expert is installed on local computers, you can go to any computer that the doctor's uh, use to fill these out and just launch it directly off the start menu. So you can actually start it, but only for administrative mode, the same way you would start any other application. Now, if you're in a hosted or like a VMware virtual environment, you would need access to the location uh, where the, the application actually lives on one of the virtual servers. Once you have that, again, you just start it from the start menu the same way that um, you would launch any other program. Thank you. And, and obviously you would need to know what the administrative username and password is for your site. And we can supply that for you. Great. And uh, just have just a couple more questions and then we will follow up with everyone else. Uh, what will happen if I don't inactivate synoptic reports before I publish new ones? Great question. Uh, the answer is when the users come back in again, they will see 
most in most in most cases most LISs will allow you to see both the older and the new version so you'll end up with uh, a mismatch of last year's this year's um, ones that are out of date so the easiest way to if that happens the easiest way is to go back into the administrator and start all over again go to your either your test or your prod environment inactivate all this time assure that you go to the uh, correct template set and then just republish them once you do that it, the database will automatically take care of all the versioning and present the correct ones that's handy. and then uh, the last question is we're unfortunately pressed for time at the moment is is there any way to print the menu list of all of the synoptic templates available no, but you can definitely get that um, from us. If you um, send an email to support at intuitive.com, we will send you um, a list which we uh, refer to as the proof sheets. And not only will it have the list of every single one, it'll also show you the content of every single one. And if you need to look up something close to that today, you can just go to the CAP paper protocol and the data for the content of those lists is going to be spelled out in the checklist. Outstanding. Well, thank you all so much. I'm going to turn it over now to Julie and thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you.